own family. People were buying guns. People were buying guard dogs. People were scared to death. The suspect has used guns, knives, tire irons, as well as his own shod foot to inflict serious injury to several victims in the past. Nobody knew who it was. Nobody knew where he was going to hit. People didn't know if they were going to live to see the next morning. It was really, really scary. And then a shocking twist. It was very obvious that uh, our killer from Southern California had now struck in the city of uh, San Francisco. On the 17th of August, the Night Stalker had shot another couple in their home, leaving a satanic symbol on the wall. A week later, he struck 50 miles south of Los Angeles, shooting the husband and sexually assaulting the wife, forcing her to swear her love for Satan. With the killer on the move, detectives were now working night and day to try to catch him before he struck again. Since the last taping, which was August 13th, 1985, the suspect in this case currently under investigation has committed two more homicides. I have the pressure of the world on me. I need to save not only my immediate family, my wife, my mother, and my kid, everybody, but the citizens of Los Angeles County. There's an animal going out there. I have to solve it. The vehicle used in this crime was a 1976 Toyota station wagon. If the vehicle is found abandoned, contact Sergeant Frank Salerno or Detective Gil Carrillo. My wife found my 13-year-old daughter crying in the bedroom. And she said, what's wrong? And she said nothing. And my wife said, no, something's wrong. What is it? And she said, I just wish this were over. I just want my dad back. Detective Carrillo didn't yet know it, but before the end of the month, he would be face to face with one of history's most heinous serial killers. By August of 1985, the Night Stalker had killed at least 13 terrorized Los Angeles County and pushed investigators to their limits. Now he appeared to be on the move and detectives feared he'd be even harder to catch. Where we'd had him localized in Los Angeles County, now all of a sudden uh, he's in the city of San Francisco. That was of great concern. But by the end of the month, a number of important leads finally came together. We actually, through informants that identified him, uh, we knew where he hung out, we knew he loved, uh, he liked drugs, and he used to hang around the Skid Row area. At the same time, there was a fingerprint recovered on the rearview mirror of a, a stolen car uh, that the killer had used, and they made Richard Ramirez off that fingerprint the sheriff of L.A. County, the chief of police of L.A. City, the chief of Glendale, decided that they were going to release the picture of the killer, Richard Ramirez, to the press immediately. When they showed him, I told my husband, oh my God, look, that's Richie. That's Richie, but that was so weird because I can't comprehend him doing something like that, not with his personality. We were in shock. I just knew what I knew of him as a child, and I was just shocked. I was just shocked. On the morning of the 29th of August, 1985, Richard Ramirez arrived in Los Angeles after visiting a brother in Arizona. Ricky walked into the nearest convenience store to buy some candy and he noticed people were were looking at him and uh, and then when he would look at them they'd look away of course and 
as he was waiting for his change, he looked at the newspapers on the counter. And every paper, there were four or five of them then from L.A. and from the area, every paper had his picture, his photograph. And then one woman, she said, uh, it's him, El Matador, which is killer in Spanish. Ramirez panicked and fled. So he started running through yards, across over fences. He uh, climbed a, about a nine-foot sound barrier wall. As he went through yards, people were calling in. They were calling in to, look, to the Los Angeles Police Department, saying, somebody's coming to my yard. I have a prowler. <laughs> Members of the Los Angeles Police Department were already on his trail. They were following the 911 calls. Continued running east in a northeasterly direction and made it all the way to Hubbard Street. He tries to carjack a female resident. She screams. We were actually still asleep. We heard a bang, then a scream. We ran out here. We noticed a tall, dark, skinny guy running and my dad right behind him. We just came running as fast as we can to assist my dad and the neighbors. Richard has been running for about two miles. Pretty much uh, caught up to him about here and uh, tackled him right here up against this fence. Citizens come out and surround him. And he was right here, just sitting down right here. He was bleeding because uh, one of the neighbors had hit him with a fence post right over the head. He was perspiring and huffing and puffing and very looked very tired and uh, scary. He yeah. looked very scary, actually. People just started coming out with the newspapers and saying, that's the killer, the maton, that's, just, you know, a night stalker. With Ramirez in custody, officers would now come face to face with the killer for the first time. When I saw him, he, he just had this evil look in his eye. He just looked so sinister, uh, as if he were possessed. He just looked evil. I remember uh, playing with his anxiety level, trying to make it go up and come down. I wanted to see what I could do to raise it or lower it. And Richard was almost to the point of hyperventilation. His head was down on the table and he's going <laughs> And for a millisecond, just for a millisecond, I'm becoming somewhat nervous. I knew that this guy was into Satanism and all of a sudden when he starts hyperventilating, I'm saying to myself, if this guy starts levitating, I'm out of here. <laughs> you know, it was... This is a guy that Although at times there were photographs taken of him that he looked like, uh, you know, a wild man. Uh, He's he not somebody somebody would point out and say, there goes that crazy SOB, because uh, he, he just doesn't come across that way. He was much more intelligent than I, than I envisioned. Uh, people think of him as a crazed man. I didn't think he was crazy. He was much, much more articulate than most murder suspects that I've interviewed. Ramirez revealed he was well-schooled in murder. The impression I got from him was that he was well-read, even though he had dropped out of school, I think after the ninth grade or so thereabouts. He, he was very interested in murder and killing and, and, and past serial killers because he had done a lot of reading on that. He could tell you everything about serial killers from the time the Romans fed the Christians to the lions to modern-day serial killers. When we took him to his first cell, and he found out that that was the cell that Angelo Bono, who was part of the Hillside Strangler duo, that's the cell he was in. He was excited. The Night Stalker had petrified California and haunted detectives Salerno and Carrillo for five months. Now he was finally behind bars. I remember seeing my mother and a couple of my sisters, and uh, they came up and we all just started, I started crying. It was over. 
I said, it's okay. It's okay. In 1989, Richard Ramirez was found guilty of 13 murders and 30 attempted murders, rapes and sexual assaults. He was sentenced to death. So what drove the night stalker to his ultimate destiny as one of history's most savage serial murderers? Were the lessons he learned in his upbringing to blame? Or was Richard Ramirez born to kill? I don't, I don't see anything in his upbringing that was any uh, more unusual than a lot of people. Uh, I know a lot of successful people have gone through hell being raised and come out just fine. This could be a case, and it probably is a case of... Uh,